Good time of day. I'm Ryan McKibben. With me as always is Jeffrey B. Moss M.W. Today on Stirring Up the Lees. A national shortage of canning cans across shelves nationwide due to the influx of backyard gardening. Is that Luckily, I was today we are talking about canned wine and not canned vegetables. We're going to try six of the <laughs> most prominent canned wines out there in a curveball at the ends. The plan today is to do a bit of a rapid fire, so we've got seven, seven cans, and we're just going to do a minute a can and see what we can come up with. See what we think. Maybe rate them in the end. Maybe a recommendation. Maybe no recommendation. Maybe drink bottled wine or a bag of bottled wine. Or beer. Or beer. In a can. Have you, have you had much uh, canned wine? You know, I have. Once. I have not. So this would be good. All right, let's get right into it. First up, Barefoot Pinot Grigio, California. Can number one. Can number one. Sorry, I probably should have poured you first. That was terribly rude. That's what I expect from you. Okay, hit that timer. Let's go. Immediately <laughs> quite, quite reductive. Uh, it's like metallic almost, but definitely reductive. Which really obscures the fruit. Like, doesn't jump out as an overly fruity wine. No, it's more matchsticky, more... Farty. Farty. Farty is the polite way to say it, I think. Flatulence? So it needs some wind, because it smells like wind. Yep. I mean, so helps having it in the wine glass, actually, because we can aerate it a bit. From the can, I guess you're a little stuck. Yeah, I don't think you're supposed to drink it from the can. Which really takes away the convenience factor of having a can of wine. <laughs> it does. Um, definitely off dry. Yep. Noticeable residual sugar. Not overly crisp or refreshing. No. A little it's, flat. It's like, yeah, it's like kind of stone fruits and not much else. Generic white wine. Yeah. So next up, we're going to have the Big House Pinot Grigio. The Birdman Pinot Grigio. From the state of California. Thank you. Oh wow. Hit that clock. Immediately more reductive, I think, than the Barefoot Pinot Grigio. I was trying to be polite at the last one saying matchstick, but this is like, this is, this is, this is harsh fire territory. <laughs> you have to really dig through that to, to get fruit? some fruits. Man, you'd think they would prepare it for a can better, but... Like, when you think of what the winemaker was hoping that a consumer would end up with in their glass, I don't think this is it. Mind you, they could be going for, like, the no... Uh, like, no-nose perception of the wine, like, crack the can. Oh, because you're on. Can. You ever you're, smell it? Right. We got I guess done. you want to be careful about putting your nose anywhere near an open <laughs> aluminum can, arguably. So, but the palate, you know, obviously this one's a bit sweeter, I think. And, but the acid, there's, there's, there's a nicer acid. A little bit more profile. freshness. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think this would be more my preference. More redeeming on the palate. Yeah. Wine number three. We're trying uh, Babe Pinot Grigio with bubbles. Avec. And I think the with bubbles is interesting because this has been carbonated. Um, let's see what we, whoa. Babe. <laughs> That's noticeably fizzy. Yes. Like soda. We're not reductive. It's not reductive. It's not much of anything, actually. It's a very neutral. Maybe some citrus fruit? Maybe? Citrus fruit. Citrus fruit on the palate. Sweet. Noticeably sweet. Definitely sweet. I think we've, we've ramped up the residual sugar. Yeah. In each white as we go. This is the least offensive of the three whites so far. This would be, the if I had to go back to one, I would probably go back to this, but it wouldn't be necessarily a style that I would reach for on an everyday basis. Yeah. But I think again, like, if you're not planning on really smelling it, if you're just drinking it straight right. can, the lack of character on the nose. And it's clean. It is clean. Yeah, I think you would want this well chilled. We're out of time. Out of time. Wine number four. Still with Babe. Ron Rosé with bubbles. Still with bubbles. 
Some people would call it sparkling wine, but in this case it's just Evec bubbles. <laughs> Bubla. Hopefully that's not a swear word in French. Uh, I'm clear from the... This one's got the classic dent. You'd never get that in any sort of wine pack, uh, bottle pack. I actually like the cans that way. I like the dent. Because I've got character. Yes. Unlike this wine, maybe. <laughs> We're back in sort of neutral territory. A little bit of candied red fruits. Yeah. And I mean like quite candied. Oh yeah. Like we're like Halloween territory of <laughs> candy. Like the, the the little candies your grandmother carries in her purse. Or like, you know, you, oh, you yeah. we go to like those chain restaurants growing up or whatever, they give you the candies with the I bill. Would, at the I end. would go back to restaurants just for that. <laughs> That's and it, it better not be a mint. That's for sure. I want a candy. <laughs> I want a candy raspberry. Um, okay. Touch sweeter still. Let's say the bubbles are kind of less predominant on this one. Yeah, not as aggressive Pinot as the Pinot Grigio with bubbles. Uh, maybe this is with some bubbles. It's definitely a confected red fruit on the palate. Though. It tastes like yeah. a candy. Do you like juice? You like this. If you like those candies, like Jeff said, <laughs> you like this one. All right, wine number five. We're back to Big House again. Big House Wine Company in California. Our first reds. This is the Cardinal Zin. <laughs> I love a good pun. I don't mm. know if that's a good pun. I don't know. It's, it's a, a good pun. pun. It's a pun. Yeah. Okay. Well. Well. <laughs> Quite confected. Oh my lord. It doesn't smell like wine. We came from a candy shop? Maybe. And then lots of fake oak as well. And I think that's not to be pejorative. I think it's just more factual statements. Um, At a production volume like this, it's just, it doesn't make logistical or fiscal sense. Some, sometimes, you know, you're, you're baking and you go out and you get the real vanilla essence. Yeah. Sometimes you're baking and you go out and you get the artificial, artificial. vanilla and you pay $10 less. Ten dollars less. I don't know. I go to expensive stores, maybe. Okay. Uh, Substantially less. And there's a time and place for both. I mean, it's not to say the artificial vanilla is bad, but it's not as good as the real vanilla essence. Yeah, this wine's super weird. It's all that like fake fruit, and then oh, we're out of time, and then really fake oak on the finish. Yeah. Like noticeably. Chill this down, like way down. But the sugar, there's like. There's no finish. It's sugar. It's just like no tannin, no acid. Noticeably sweet. Yeah. <laughs> just sugar. Even the alcohol doesn't like burn enough to make a finish. It's just sugar. Yeah. The confected fruit, confected oak, residual sugar just gives <laughs> an, an overall impression of sweetness. Anyways, that's well over a minute. We're well so over a minute. Going on. Point number six. Going Jordan. across the globe. Linda Mins, Shiraz. Shiraz. From Australia. Yeah, uh, I, I think, yeah. There's uh, cherries and chocolate on the label. This is, this is a more traditional uh, packaging than the other oh. ones. Like more. I would say a less traditional nose. Holy smoke. <laughs> smoke is holy smokes. There's smoke. I wonder if it's liquid smoke. <laughs> <laughs> You're not far off. We talked about that artificial vanilla, but you know sometimes you get that liquid smoke when you want Like those barbecue sauces? Yes, yeah, liquid, liquid, liquid smoke. smoke. We don't actually have time to smoke anything. We'll just put liquid. Smoke. Is that oak or is that actual smoke? I think it's l actual smoke because it it's not like a nice charred, like <sighs> like heavy toast barrel. It's imagine smoke. you have like a basket of blackberries that were picked quite ripe. You know when they're just like basically bloated yeah. and overflowing, and then they were placed next to a campfire, <laughs> left for eight, eight to ten hours. And this is what you have. I'll take the brisket that was cooking beside it. Good lord. Do we even taste it? Mm -mm. Oh wow. Oh my god. <laughs> That's noticeably How much sweet. sugars in this. <laughs> I think honestly, if you closed my eyes and gave me a liquid and it was this, I wouldn't be able to tell you it was wine. <laughs> it's like almost as sweet as pop. Because oh, pop yeah. has more acid. This is just it's like just really flat, flat yeah. sugar. God, we're being negative. All right, that was a little over a minute again, so let's let's finish this up. All right, rounding out number seven. This is uh, this our curveball. Curve 
the, the black sheep maybe of the actually no it's not sheep it's a hog it's a hog's ass or is it a lady. boar boar but what we're tasting is sparkling lambrusco from italy frico i guess lambrusco is typically sparkling so that's a little redundant nonetheless for those unfamiliar with this style it's a sparkling red wine maybe you've had sparkling shiraz this is I mean, we're comparable because there's not that many sparkling red wines in the world. Um, but let's taste it. Anyways, we got a minute here. To me, I love Lombrusco. And this is a pretty classic yeah, rose, actually. Yeah, like this is... We're, we're, in a, we're in a different category here. It immediately the, smells like wine, which yeah. probably places it as the outlier. Yeah. I mean, there's an elegance. It's like actually f proper fruit. Oh, yeah. Fresh, like ripe Black fruits. Yeah, we're in the black fruit spectrum. With some nice and the savory herbs. Yeah. It just invites you in. I want to drink pretty, this. Very pretty nose. But again, like this this um, producer might not be thinking about like the experience of the customer. Because if the customer's grabbing this and just sculling it out of the can, they're not going to get to enjoy the... And that's the difference here. Because still a touch of residual sugar, which is typical for Lombrusco, but... A little bit more of a tannin presence. Mm. And that's, again, an outlier from the other six because it's a little bit more structured. It's not something necessarily I'm taking to the beach and just crushing. Yeah. We've obviously gone over time for this because this is uh, definitely a better example of wine and can. But there, there is some definite residual sugar on the palate, but it's, it's more in balance with this wine. It, they balanced it with the slight effervescence. They balanced it with the acid profile. Mm -hmm. So you just don't feel like you're chewing on hard candies. But it fits with the style that you expect from Lombresco. Yeah. I mean, I think if we pour this next to Lombresco from a bottle, maybe comparable. I don't know. Comparable. I don't know if we can tell the difference. This is solid. I would recommend this, actually. <laughs> this this gets the, the, uh, the seal of approval. All right, so well, we went way over a minute on this one, but we need to rank these, I guess. Well, we don't. I almost to. think we exclude this as the clear outlier. Yeah. I like we said, we recommend it. Pick it up. Yeah. So, like we said, this isn't one of the preeminent producers of canned wine globally, but if you do see this one, it's still in a similar price range. So I think. Oh, it's not expensive. For value, you're you're. You're getting your money's worth with this one. So if you do see this one, grab that. But It's uh, a style that's a little bit in the middle of nowhere in the sense you don't see a lot of sparkling red wines. Yeah. So when you have it for the first time, you don't really know what you're drinking. It's a little hard to adjust to. Have that second sip though. You know, eventually you'll get accustomed to it. Yeah. Have that third sip. <laughs> Open up a package of prosciutto. Oh, yeah. Other cured meats. Do yourself a favor too and pour it in a glass. It needs yes, to be in a glass. do not have this from can. I like mean, I, can in a pinch. You can in a pinch. I, yeah, I understand the convenience factor of it being in a can, and you might not always have a glass handy. But there's great like it doesn't even need to be a wine glass. Just a vessel that allows you to get some sort of nasal experience. Yeah. Starbucks cup. Yeah, it doesn't matter what it is. Anything. Red Solo cup. Just anything but the can because. You, like, I got a big nose, but I, I can't, I, you know, Get that smells in there. So if we ignore this, though, and we go back to the other six, how are we ranking them? But I'll do, um, I'll do the Bay Pinot Grigio with bubbles. I'll do the Big House, even though it was noticeably reductive. The Big House Pinot, Pinot Grigio. Grigio. I'll do the Barefoot Pinot Grigio, the Bay Rosé with bubbles, the Lindemann's Shiraz. Um, okay. Oh, I'll do the Big House Zin before the Lindemann Shiraz. I'm just impressed that you gave your ranking so quickly because honestly, there's not a huge difference between any of these wines. Well, I didn't want to just be like, Frico, number one, everything else, doesn't really matter. Yeah, but that's more or less the right answer, I think. <laughs> you know, we're, we're more talking about stylistic differences between these cans. You know, you have the two Pinot Grigios, fairly reductive. Well, it's actually funny you mentioned that because there's a reason that we've seen beverage alcohol in cans from midway through the 20th century, but we haven't really seen wine in cans. Why is that? Uh, I guess they had like 
the, you know, the original one you saw was beer, right? Which has a higher pH, maybe more sugar. What less pH acid. are we talking? Yeah. I'm going to brew around five, five to six. Yeah, and then water seven. And so they had difficulties because I guess they were trying to bottle, oh, sorry, can wine back when cans were introduced. Right, okay. But they had difficulties with the alcohol level, the S, the acidity level, like the pH, we're talking closer to three, between three and four, mm -hmm. and the, also the fact that it contains sulfites. So the right. sulfites were actually reacting with the aluminum and creating really more, more reductive flavors than what we were seeing in those first two whites. Right. Like just rotten eggs and the harshest of An intense of parts. level. Right. It's 2020 and we've made some changes in terms of how we can wine. Yeah, so when canned wine first got uh, commercial acceptance and viability, it was Australia. They basically patented a, a plastic epoxy liner that they put in the cans that would not react with the wine right. inside. And that was a while back. That was before the turn of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. But within the last 10 years, we've seen massive, massive growth in this segment. So with that in mind, why do you think we saw that reductive character in, that, in those first two whites? Yeah, it's interesting because there's definitely ways about avoiding that. And I think that's a pretty concrete science when it comes to bottling wine, when it comes to bag and box wines. But I think maybe because this format's so new, so young, that they, like even these massive, massive companies haven't really quite figured it out yet. Right, there's still a learning opportunity because I find it difficult to believe that deep down that's what Gallo wants that Barefoot Pinot Grigio to taste like. Yeah. Versus the Babe, more of an Elka Pop style, not you know necessarily a serious wine, but quite fruity, easy drinking, and it's no surprise that it's made by Anheuser-Busch, one of the largest breweries in the world. Mm -hmm. And then you have the two reds, and the two reds is where it goes completely sideways to me. You know, what I like about Babe, in a way, is it's not trying to be something that it's not. You brought up Anheuser-Busch, which is obviously one of the largest corporations, brewing corporations in the world. And so this segment of the market, can, wine and cans, is the most rapidly growing segment yeah, it's in the wine industry. By how much? It was almost 100 times its growth within the last decade. 100 times? Not 100%. Not like 2 million to 4 million. Like 100 times. 100 wow. times. Wow. It's astronomical. And so I think Anheuser-Busch is tracking that. They've caught on to that. And so they launched this Bay project, which has been hugely successful. Yeah. Probably well, the because... large companies aren't dumb. And we're tasting no. predominantly large brands yeah. with the exception of the curveball. Well, so Anheuser-Busch was like, man, this canned wine market's cutting into our market share of canned alcohol, basically. So let's produce our own. Yeah. And they've probably sunk a ton of money in marketing and coming up with the brand. But it's actually really well done, I think. Yeah. Because I've been on a lot of winery websites and I probably have spent the most time on the Babe website than any other winery website just because it's a little different you know it actually has a personality and you, when you taste it you can tell what they're going for yeah. the and wine does not have a personality yeah it's <laughs> not very characterful but if i'm at the beach playing volleyball half naked <laughs> um With your you don't need to imagine that but let's say i am you know i could see the babe would be something i would reach for mm -hmm. Where I guess I'm confused, you know, what I love about the can format, easy to go anywhere, a hike. Back to hiking, we know you don't hike. I don't hike. Camping, I don't camp. But it's a big venue thing too, because when you think of sports venues, I think Babe is a national partner with the NFL. Right. Because oh, yeah, you can grab a can of Babe and go down to your seat, you know, maybe you don't like Budweiser. So you just, you've got your can of bathe. But that's where the reds, that, that's where the reds kind of throw me for a loop. Because if I'm at the beach, like, do I want... Do I want red wine to, to begin with? Yeah, and do I want, like, a sweet red? Do I want a campfire smoky red? Yeah, like, like does your father-in-law want that? Oh, he'd love that. Oh, oh okay. he, he loves Big House Anything. in every format. Oh, so is it, you would have this in can as well? Yeah, but I think 
because like friends of mine outside of the wine industry are you know very black and white they're a white wine drinker they're a red wine drinker right you know they don't necessarily cross are they like a with or without bubbles as well uh that's a good question i don't know the answer to that one but definitely they'll say i'm a red wine drinker i drink red i don't drink yeah. white it's too sweet you, you know they'll, they'll say something yeah. like that and Although, they drink like sweet red wine. Ironically, yeah, the two reds the were sweetest. almost the sweetest in the lineup <laughs> if we exclude Babe to some extent. Yeah. But that Lindemann's 18 grams per liter residual sugar. That's a considerable amount of sugar. It's also interesting as a aside, but the packaging is very similar to the classic Lindemann's Bin 50 Shiraz, you know, that everyone's probably had once in their life. You know, it's not very expensive. This can packaging is almost identical, but it's not the bin 50, it's double the amount of residual sugar, <laughs> and then only 9% alcohol. So you can see they've clearly adapted yeah. to the format. Well, crack a can. Crack a can. Crack two. Well, we can't uh, responsibly advise that. Which actually is an interesting point, because most of these cans are two servings a can. I think maybe that goes into the lower alcohol too, because they know they've got a finite volume. You know, like they're not going to bury the size of the can. Right. Based on the alcohol of the wine. So they're saying, okay, we're 9%. We're two standard drinks per 250 ml can. Well, you know what I, I struggle with? Like, because you put a can in my hand and I think it's cider or I think it's gluten-free beer. And I'm going to drink it at that pace. <laughs> and you put a 13.5% red wine in a can in my hand. And I'm going to drink it at cider <laughs> or beer pace. Yeah. You learn that lesson though, and I think maybe the producers have also learned that lesson <laughs> in terms of, okay, if I'm on the beach having a can, let's be a little bit more responsible. Cheers, everybody. Yeah, cheers. Uh, if you like that episode, like, subscribe. If you didn't like it, still like and subscribe, actually. It's going to get better. It helps us out. <laughs> <laughs> Hit that alarm, the alert. So you'll be notified of all our upcoming episodes. And if you have a favorite canned wine that we didn't try today, throw it in the comments.